tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We're going to throw everything we have at this issue. Slated for surgery, why it'll take two years to clear the backlog caused by COVID-19. Also, don't make it, um, you know, two people one night, four people who are different the next night. How to expand your social circle and not let the deadly virus in and what a better way to put a smile on a kid's face by seeing a superhero out there. Taking out the trash with Captain America and your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. BC is launching a massive effort to get non-emergency surgeries back on schedule. Back in March, 30,000 patients had procedures halted because of COVID-19. And as the CBC's Tanya Fletcher reports, it'll take as long as two years to clear the backlog. Mike, the pandemic has wiped out many of the gains the province has made in recent years to reduce surgery wait times. The B.C. government says they're now embarking on an ambitious plan and it'll resume in a way that's dramatically different. It was, uh, in some respects, easy to shut that down. It's easy to say no in a system. Much harder to get going again because we have cases continuing into the system. We have to assess patients for the urgency of the surgery. It's an enormous challenge. And because we have people on a wait list already, and this simply adds to that and uh, presents a real challenge for the system. Here are some of the biggest challenges with relaunching the system. The province will have to immediately ramp up surgery capacity by extending operating hours and mobilizing more private clinics. That means new funding is needed, a quarter billion dollars in the next year alone. The bulk of that will go towards recruiting more personnel. BC is looking to hire hundreds more nurses, surgeons and anesthesiologists. And it's all coming on an ambitious timeline, 17 to 24 months to clear the backlog. And that's if there are no setbacks like a potential second wave of the pandemic. Despite all that, Premier John Horgan says it was without a doubt worth it to have our health care system positioned to handle a possible surge in COVID-19 cases. Absolutely the right thing to do, but we need to put into a context that uh, today is the day after uh, we announced our slow and focused restart plan and the first order of business is to say to those who made a significant sacrifice by uh, having their surgeries cancelled that they're at the top of the priority list for us going forward. Here are the new protocols for how patients will get back into the system. First up will be priority patients. Anyone with a wait time less than four weeks, they'll receive a call anytime now to confirm they're ready and willing to go. Then they'll be pre-screened over the phone 24 to 72 hours hours before surgery. They'll also receive a day of assessment when they arrive and then medical teams will allocate personal protective equipment as needed for each surgery. Now, even as all these scheduled surgeries were halted, 17,000 emergency surgeries have still been completed in recent weeks. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, even though BC is planning to ease restrictions on work and life amid COVID-19, Dr. Bonnie Henry is still urging you to be very careful. BC's top doctor says she doesn't want to undo the good work people have done to flatten the curve. Our Dan Burrett joins us now live with a refresher on the restart plan. Dan, uh, remind us what the timelines are here. There was a lot of information from BC's restart plan yesterday, Mike, and there has been some confusion about when we can do what. So take a look at the phases that are being planned. Phase one, which we are in right now, has essential services and some businesses opening back up. As for phase two, that's set for mid-May. In fact, the Premier stresses that's after Victoria Day long weekend, includes reopening hair salons and personal services, more retail, in-person counselling, some sports, and places like libraries. Phase three, from June to September, has more services opening, but with more protections. Restaurants, for example, are aiming for June 1st, but they have to have their plan approved by WorkSafe, and then those eateries have to tailor their locations. Phase four, large gatherings, but that's conditional on a vaccine or a treatment. No date on that quite yet. The weather this weekend is set to be lovely, as we are hearing. And Dr. Henry's encouraged people to get outside for their physical and their mental well-being. But she admits there are no hard and fast rules around meeting people and expanding your social circle. Still, she has some suggestions. Keep your gatherings small, no more than six people. Keep physically distanced. And if you can, do it outside. 
expand your circle. And in New Zealand, they've been talking about, you know, double your bubble. Okay, that's a way of thinking about it. But don't make it, um, you know, two people one night, four people who are different the next night. What we want to do is make sure that we increase our social connections with the people who are close to us, but that we are very mindful that if we have connections, we're then connected with their connections, and that increases our risk. And remember, this weekend is Mother's Day, so lots of families will want to get together. They'll have to think about how they're going to manage that. And then there's the May long weekend, and it's only then we are to move to phase two, not earlier. When it comes to the big gatherings we hinted at, like concerts and festivals, Dr. Henry says those will not be allowed this summer. She doesn't even see them happening the rest of the year, Mike. All right, Dan, thanks very much. Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Now, the number of COVID-19 cases in B.C. is on the rise again, and there are slightly more hospitalizations. There have been two new deaths since yesterday. However, the government didn't say which regions. That brings our total to 126. While there are 33 new cases, there are no new outbreaks in long-term care homes, and 18 previous outbreaks have now been declared over. 76 people are now in hospital, 20 of those in intensive care. But the number of people who have now fully recovered from COVID-19 is at more than 1,500. Well, two men have been arrested after 6,000 face masks and hand sanitizer was stolen from a senior's home in Vancouver. Police say the two broke into a storage area in the terraces on 7th Avenue and grabbed the personal protective equipment. The crime was caught on surveillance cameras and the stolen property has since been recovered. 28-year-old Jesse Colty is now facing charges. Having the proper PPE at their disposal is vital. Having this equipment taken from them is very frustrating and extremely upsetting. Charges of break and enter and possession of property attain, obtained by crime were approved against Cootley by Crown Council. Charges against the second suspect have been recommended. Police allege the men were planning to sell the equipment on social media. Well, as Dan mentioned a couple of minutes ago, hair salons, barbers, and personal service establishments are part of the list of businesses that can reopen from mid-May onwards. Businesses need to implement measures to maintain physical distancing and need to submit those plans to WorkSafe BC. Artina Lovegreen has more on how it might actually roll out. Hairstylist Sabrina Kauks already has a wait list, and the salon hasn't even opened yet. People are dying to come get their hair done. She's excited to get back to cutting hair, but also a bit hesitant. Just with everything that's going on and, you know, staying safe, I am four months pregnant and I want to make sure I'm, you know, staying safe for myself and for my baby. While the salon has drawn up some protocols for what reopening may look like, the official guidelines have not come in yet. No magazines, no drinks or teas that we can offer clients anymore. Um, clients have to wear masks and I have to wear a mask and gloves when I'm cutting hair. The Beauty Council of Western Canada has put together a framework, but that still needs to be reviewed by WorkSafe and the provincial health officer. The way we see reopening happening is a couple of, couple of things are going to change. Your salon won't be that fun, you know, huggy, talky place that you know it to be. There, there may be masks, there probably will be masks, there'll be less talking. But some in the industry say it's too early to expect salons to open up in a matter of weeks without approved guidelines. I can't get PPE. Nobody can tell me if uh, the, the gloves that we've ordered, which are non-medical, are even going to be adequate. Um, we don't know if we need to have face shields. We don't know if I can get plexiglass. Other industries are in the same position, waiting for protocols to be drawn up and approved. We've got an idea, but we have not yet got our instructions, our requirements from our College of Physiotherapy, but we're expecting that any day. But they've started preparing in advance for what's to come. The hand sanitizers, the two pails are, are liquid hand sanitizer, and then we've got um, masks that, are, um, that will probably be used for patients. And taking note from other provinces. We know we need physical distancing. We know we will need masks of some sort. We questionable whether we'll need gloves or just hand washing. While various industries are still figuring out their reopening plan, it's sure to look and feel different. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. A traditional Chinese medicine that claims it can treat COVID-19 symptoms endorsed by the Chinese government has ended up here in Canada. 
The Chinese embassy is sending the pills to Chinese students across the country. It's causing confusion and driving a spike in prices online. But as Lian Young reports tonight, Canadian doctors and health authorities are warning the public to read the fine print. A quick hello and a photo. A box of 200 care packages given by the Chinese embassy handed out by Capilano University volunteers. Filled with COVID-19 supplies, dozens of masks, disinfectant wipes and information pamphlet. And the most important thing is the Lianhua Qingming capsule, two boxes. The pills have been approved by Chinese health authorities who say they may help alleviate minor fever and fatigue in mild COVID cases. But headlines have hyped Lianhua Qingwen, calling it an effective treatment for the virus. Prices online have jumped to about four times the cost in China. And some Chinese students in Canada have bought in. So now I know it is approved by the Chinese government as a treatment for COVID-19. That's the part that's uh, a little bit disturbing because uh, we know that there's no official uh, proven treatments for COVID-19, meaning there's nothing that can get rid of the virus. Dr. Peter Lin says it's like picking up a pack of Tylenol and saying it can fight the virus. Traditional Chinese medicine practitioners are also cautious. It's not a one-size-fits-all type medicine. Jetta Boughton says Chinese medicine is based on the philosophy that every person is different, and so are their symptoms. You don't necessarily want to be using it on everyone, and so when you're distributing it, you want to be careful to, to make sure that people know that it's being used on the right, in the right pattern, on the, in the right way. China's Deputy Consul General in Vancouver, Kong Weiwei, says students should know that. I believe when they're studying here, he says, they've learned from Canadians how to read instructions on medicine in detail. They are not babies. <laughs> Health experts say Lianhua Qingwen pills shouldn't be taken as a preventative measure and shouldn't be taken at all without talking to a doctor first, especially if you have COVID-19. Lian Young, CBC News, Vancouver. And while we have all been preoccupied with COVID-19, BC's other big health crisis, illicit drug overdose deaths, have been surging. 113 people died in BC in March. That's the most deaths in a single month in a year. And it's up 61% over February. Every health authority in the province saw increased death rates. Three quarters were men aged 19 to 49. Well, COVID-19 has put many Canadians in a dire financial situation. With stores shuttered and debts piling up, experts are predicting a surge in bankruptcies. Greg Rasmussen spoke to some small business owners about the challenges ahead. Shuffling products is the only activity left in this once bustling hair salon. I've just spent eight years of my life working around the clock to build a business for eventually have a retirement fund. Bills piling up, a once unthinkable option is now on the table. Tomorrow morning, I still would owe upwards of $600,000 on that house with no revenue to pay it. You see a lot of small business people where really their, their personal lines of credit, their credit cards, really are intermixed with their business. They really haven't separated them yet. They haven't gotten to credit counselors and bankruptcy trustees are being flooded with calls from people facing insolvency despite government support programs. It brings me a big, big concern and depression, really. This Vancouver bike rental shop depends on tourists. 20 employees have been laid off and the owner has personally guaranteed his business loans. He says many entrepreneurs he knows are in the same boat. Bankruptcy is going to be one of the options on the table for them as well as us. If we cannot go to the business by um, June, June 15, uh, I don't think we can survive a next season. Formal bankruptcy filings usually show up months after an economic downturn. The insolvencies are going to spike like crazy. But people who have you know, put everything into their small businesses you know, are getting wiped out by something that was completely artificial, right? And it had nothing to do with how they did business. With 10 years invested at this shop, it's hard to give up on a dream. One customer finally arrives, but he only needs his tire filled. But you can't run a business on air. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. A tough stance from TNT supermarkets to try to protect workers and the public 
going to insist you wear a mask while shopping at their stores. The grocery chain says starting Monday, masks will be mandatory. It recommends disposable masks, but says other coverings will be acceptable. They have also been taking customers' temperatures. Whole Foods is also going to be requesting customers use masks. That grocer says it'll provide masks for those not already wearing them. And the Better Business Bureau is sending a warning to Canadians to beware of COVID-19 scams. Over the last couple of months, the Better Business Bureau saw a 5% increase in reports about COVID-19 scams. Almost 60% of victims lost money, as well as personal and banking information through submitting fake forms. Most of the scams involve selling things like masks, sanitizers, fake COVID-19 vaccines, and cures, even pets. The BBB says Canadians should protect themselves by only buying from reputable stores and websites and being wary of unsolicited text messages, emails, calls or messages via social media. Well, there are no specific reopening dates yet for City of Vancouver services closed because of COVID-19. The province has said things are going to open in phases. Uh, they've got provincial-wide phases. We'll probably have phases here at the city as well, although um, our, I guess our goal is to try to get stuff open as, as quickly as we can, but as safely, uh, you know, having safety as the, as the top priority. Libraries, some community centers, playgrounds, and outdoor recreation facilities have been shut down for more than six weeks in Vancouver. The city says it'll need to wait a bit longer to reopen, given their size and popularity. A well, surprise flooding is leaving people in several Kelowna neighborhoods looking for higher ground tonight. Early this morning, Mill Creek burst its banks and flooded homes and streets. City officials believe a rainstorm high in the watershed caused debris torrents and blockages in the waterway. The sudden floodwaters had apartment residents scrambling to get out of their homes and in some cases their cars out of submerged parking lots. I felt like I was on Titanic, like the water was all the way up to my knees and you're trying so hard to push the door open and you can't because it's too hard. And then we managed to get into like the parkade of where a car was and it felt like you had to swim to your vehicle. Mill Creek flows through Kelowna and flooded in both 2017 and 18 causing extensive damage. And the water woes don't stop there. An evacuation alert is in place for areas of the village of Lumbee, along the Duteau, Bassett, and Harris Creeks. All right, let's bring in uh, meteorologist Brett Soderholm. Um, what's the weather situation in that area? Is it going to have, have an impact? Uh, well, yes, in a certain way, we're going to be looking at clearing conditions and drying conditions, so that is going to be helpful news. From the research that I could tell, yeah, that uh, report of heavy rainfall being largely one of the big contributors to that flooding situation was definitely the case. Estimates say that about 15 to perhaps 25 millimeters of rain fell over that region, which then, of course, combined with a bit of debris, led to some blockage and some localized flooding. But that said, on a wider scale, as we get closer to the summer, we're going through our melt season, and of course, with warmer temperatures, that's going to rapidly melt our snowpack and that could potentially increase the water levels pretty well everywhere across BC. And I do want to show you at this point in time, we still have a couple of advisories to be noting. It's a little tricky, I admit, but flooding concerns specifically involve a high stream flow advisory for places like the Boundary Region and the Okanagan. And this is because, of course, with warmer temperatures on the way, there is the potential here for river levels to be rising, although we're not expecting much in the way of flooding imminently. And at the same time, definitely worth passing along as well that we still have a flood watch in effect for the caribou region this is essentially a step up from the high stream flow advisory and this is because water levels in that region are still rising and could lead to larger scale flooding in the next little bit and i do think this is a good time to be mentioning that we we have a lot of warmth expected all across bc throughout saturday you can see especially here on the south coast temperatures will be into the 20 degree range and that's going to be continuing through sunday as well so while it is going to feel nice certainly to get a little bit of those warmer temperatures coming it is as a result going to be melting our snowpack and we've been dealing with about above average conditions so that is going to probably come together and potentially raise those stream flow levels in the next little feet while all right very good we will talk to you again in a bit thanks brett and a quick reminder you can watch this newscast live on cbc gem the free app is also where you can find other cbc programs and cbc vancouver is also on facebook youtube and instagram and you can follow me and anita and brett on Twitter and Instagram. Well, for decades, he has been Canadian fashion royalty. 
But Peter Nygaard is also the defendant in a class action lawsuit. 46 women claim he sexually assaulted them. Coming up for the first time, we'll hear from one of them. And thanks for staying with us online for extra COVID-19 coverage during the television commercial break. Well, how and where we work has certainly changed since the start of this pandemic. And as we move towards reopening, those changes are far from over. Aaron Saltzman looks at some of the ways workspaces will have to adapt to keep employees safe. To get a sense of what Canada's workplaces may look like, look to other countries ahead of the curve, like Italy, where they've installed traffic lights for washrooms. Green means go, literally. They've already passed temperature checks to get into the building. Once inside, a smartphone app monitors if they're within a meter and a half of someone else for more than 15 seconds. It's not a tool to spy on us, this worker says. It may be a little less big brother in Canada, but experts say workplaces here will also see big changes. We started the six feet office project. With the this global real estate firm is suggesting one way hallways, desks with plexiglass dividers, workers using disposable pads to limit hard surface contact and allow for easier cleaning. Shared areas like lounge space may need to be booked in advance. Elevators will be limited to just a few people per ride, which could mean long queues in high-rise towers. But that would be mitigated by a gradual return to work, starting with perhaps two or three days a week in the office and alternating those days between co-workers. Many of these measures could stay in place until there's a viable vaccine or a treatment. That could mean working from home in some form or another for months or possibly even years. For some, the change could even be permanent. A lot of companies are now seeing that it is possible to still be efficient while a lot of their employees are not in the office. That could have an effect on commercial property values. If that's 20 or 30 percent of the population working from home, and certainly that will um, soften demand on real estate. But even with fewer people inside, she says, offices will likely need more space to keep people separate. Either way, return to work may never truly be return to normal. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. And while offices grapple with how to return to work, restaurants have been busy innovating in anticipation of welcoming back customers. We have different lives, so it's fun to like, get out there again and dis discover like new restaurants. <laughs> Take a look at how one business in the Netherlands is transforming itself in light of the pandemic. The owners call them glass cabins and say it's a novel way of ensuring physical distancing. As you can see, servers are protected by face shields. The concept is being tested ahead of Dutch restaurants officially reopening their patios to customers on June 1st. And of course, a lot of restaurants here are trying to figure out uh, what they'll do to try to reopen in a safe manner in the coming weeks. All right, stay with us. More news in just a matter of seconds right here. Well, for decades, Peter Nygaard has been Canadian fashion royalty, head of a clothing empire based in Winnipeg. He's also the defendant in a class action lawsuit. 46 women claim they were sexually assaulted by him. 18 are Canadian. Tonight, for the first time, one of them is speaking publicly. The Fifth Estate's Bob McCowan has her story and a warning it contains disturbing details. She says it happened here at Peter Nygaard's estate in the Bahamas in the summer of 1998. All the accusers in this case remain anonymous, so she's known as Jane Doe 16. According to her claim, she was 19 years old when her Bahamian tennis coach introduced her to Nygaard. He um, kept referring to this person as chief or boss um, and how he has an amazing tennis court on his property and that he would love to take me there to play tennis with him. After a game with Peter Nygaard, she says he invited her to stay for dinner, then beyond. He offered me my own cabana to stay for the rest of the summer. You know, he said I, you know, could enjoy the beach and enjoy the tennis and, and that it would be great. But she says it wasn't 
According to the lawsuit, she was drugged, raped, and sodomized. He put me down on the bed. He pulled my dress up. And he held me down, and uh, he sodomized me. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I'd never felt that kind of pain before, and I was scared. But I was alone, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't stop it. You mean he wouldn't stop? No. The lawsuit also claims Nygaard forced her to have sex with some of his friends. And I just, I did what he said. I just did what he said. 22 years later, she says she and the 45 other Jane Doe's are now trying to address the damage done to them by Peter Nygaard. It's impacted my relationships. It's impacted um, my whole life. But I just want to be able to ease that, that pain a bit, knowing that someone didn't get away with it and that there was at least some justice, and I think the pain may lessen. None of the allegations in the lawsuit have been proven in court. Through his lawyers, Nygaard absolutely and categorically denies the claims made by Jane Doe 16, adding she has probably been paid for false evidence. Bob McEwen, CBC News, Toronto. More military resources are being deployed in eastern Canada to help in the fight against COVID-19. Our Julie Van Dusen looks at the latest mission for the armed forces and what they'll be doing. COVID-19 has hit long-term care homes hard, accounting for about 80% of the deaths in Canada. Many facilities are understaffed, often described as a war zone, as those on the front lines fight to keep the virus contained. Soldiers are already deployed in 13 long-term care facilities in Quebec, but that will soon jump to 25 in the coming weeks, with 1,350 Canadian Forces personnel in place. In Ontario, 265 medical and support personnel are assisting in five facilities across the greater Toronto area. It's an unusual humanitarian mission. Our Canadian Armed Forces members have moved very quickly, figured out the training, done something that they have never done before because that's exactly what was needed for our, our elderly. Almost all uniformed medical personnel are working in long-term care homes. They're supported by soldiers who have been given about five days of training to learn their new duties. Moving equipment, helping with logistics on the inside, cleaning um, and uh, food service. Um, uh, duties not associated with the intimate medical care of an individual. COVID-19 has also put a focus on the low pay of those who work in long-term care. Many shuttle between homes to try to make ends meet. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that Ottawa will invest $3 billion, the province's $1 billion, to top up the wages of essential workers who earn under $2,500 a month. Some provinces have already pledged to top up for their long-term care workers. We're relying on these workers now more than ever and we will be there to support them. COVID-19 has exposed chronic problems in many seniors' homes. The Prime Minister says sending in soldiers is not a long-term solution. But for the provinces, it buys time as they try to come up with a plan to deal with the crisis. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. A pair of suspects is facing charges in a series of cell phone tower fires in Quebec. As Katie Nicholson tells us, it comes amid a conspiracy theory tying the towers to COVID-19. Flames consume a cellular tower last Friday, the first of seven such fires in Quebec. Today, a man and woman in their early 20s were charged with setting two of them. The investigation is looking that they were uh, responsible for seven of the, the, the arson. They pleaded not guilty. Whoever set the fires, the question is why? Europe might offer a clue. There, police are investigating a possible link between fire damaged towers and 5G conspiracy theories. I think it would be uh, an astronomical coincidence if uh, these two people uh, allegedly decided to start burning masks for an unrelated reason. Uh, I'd be really shocked if it wasn't connected to that. But what 5G act actually does, it absorbs oxygen. So what's it about? The idea being pushed by some is that the pandemic is caused not by a virus, but by radiation from 5G towers. 
amplified online by celebrities like Woody Harrelson, John Cusack, and musician MIA. But anti-5G sentiment was already alive and well in Quebec. Protesters took to the streets in January. And for some, the idea 5G COVID fears are behind the fires isn't a big leap. It offers you something very concrete to blame. And, you know, the brain abhors a vacuum. And we, and we like to have something that we can, we can act against. I mean, this pandemic has made us feel very much uh, anxious and at, uh, at a loss of, for control. Rogers says no 5G equipment was damaged in any of the fires. And TELUS says it is working with police to protect its infrastructure. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, if you still have questions about COVID-19, one of our experts is back tonight to answer them. Give us a call, send us an email. Dr. Michael Curry is here live just ahead. And we are continuing live with bonus content online during our second TV commercial break. Well, during this time of isolation and physical distancing, playing sports with other people has been nearly impossible, at least not in person. Jason Vio has the story of one group of Canadians created a virtual dart league, and they sure hit the bullseye. <laughs> Triple again. Playing darts in the basement isn't a lonely sport anymore, and Travis Bondi takes the isolation dart league seriously. So much so, he cut out a chunk of his basement ceiling. My ceiling's kind of low in my basement, and I was having trouble hitting double 20. So that's the top number um, without the ceiling coming into play. So I knew right away it had to be scrapped. If I was going to take this serious, the ceiling had to go. The virtual league is made up of 18 friends and family from Windsor, Toronto, and Montreal across the country to Halifax and Kamloops, BC. They connect online three times a week to play darts and socialize. Yeah, when this whole thing first started, you know, a month ago sort of thing, it was, it was tough finding positives in the middle of a pandemic. They say it's pretty easy for any group to get started. Find that dartboard in your basement, dust it off, find a spot on your wall to hang it up, and then connect with your friends and family, set up your camera, and then take your shot. Some even use dining room chairs and stacks of books to ensure the camera captures the full board. I legit get nervous before matches, so it, it is pretty intense. But it's much more than fierce competition. After matches, spectators join the video chat. Great match, guys. Which often carries on for hours. I think it's awesome, like, especially in times like these where, you know, we're kind of craving some sort of connection as well as some sort of athletic, quasi-competitive, you know, void that needs to be filled. And the competitive spirit is palpable especially since the league is in the midst of May mania. It's their version of the college basketball phenomenon March Madness that was canceled due to COVID-19. Normal March Madness has Selection Sunday, so we had a Zoom call where we un un unveiled the whole bracket and who's the number one seed, who are they playing. There's even a board of directors to govern play in a constitution that spells out the honor system. It's almost like it's one big joke, but everybody's taking the joke super serious. In the end, they hope this is the start of something new, a virtual dart league that goes beyond the bullseye and hopefully lasts past this pandemic. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor. Spill some beer on the floor to make it sticky so it's kind of more realistic, like you were actually playing darts somewhere. All right, uh, stay with us. We got Dr. Michael Curry coming by to uh, answer your COVID-19 questions. Uh, of course, he can talk about the uh, restrictions that are being gradually lifted. So you know how to get a hold of us, send us an email, give us a phone call, post a uh, comment in the uh, comment section and we'll put those questions to him in just a couple of seconds. Stay right here. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. What we want to do is make sure that we increase our social connections with the people who are close to us, but that we are very mindful that if we have connections, we're then connected with their connections, and that increases our risk. Dr. Bonnie Henry is still urging you to be very careful as you expand your social connections. 
She says she doesn't want to undo the good work people have done to flatten the COVID-19 curve. Small gatherings of between two and six people are being allowed before the May long weekend. And the number of COVID-19 cases in BC is on the rise again. There are slightly more hospitalizations as well. Two new deaths being reported since yesterday, bringing our province's total to 126. There are 33 new cases tonight. 76 people are now in hospital, 20 of those in intensive care. But the number of people who've recovered is now over 1,500. Well, for those who've been waiting indefinitely for surgery, finally some good news. BC and Ontario are unveiling plans to allow elective surgeries. As Renee Filippone reports, that can't come soon enough. Mary Melvaganum was lucky in March when her kidney cancer was caught early, but cancelled surgeries have left her in limbo. It's already a stressful diagnosis because I know um, I have a chance to basically if they caught it on time to, to recover. She's hopeful the news from BC today means answers soon. More than 30,000 surgeries were cancelled in BC because of COVID-19, ranging from cancer removal to cataracts. They've been living in pain. Today, we'll start the process of relieving that pain for people who have been suffering because of the, uh, the lack of elective surgeries. I'll but it's going to, to take time. Now. Up to two years to clear the backlog in BC. This patient advocate says in a system with wait lists already, this level of backlog isn't surprising. It's not a sense of you can just switch the light on and everything shuffles back into, into play. More than 100,000 elective surgeries have been cancelled across Canada. PEI, with its low infection rate, has already started back up. But in places like Montreal, with higher rates of infection and understaffing, it will be much tougher. Today, Ontario and Manitoba unveiled its plans, but with no specific timelines. I would say it's going to be uh, several weeks before we're able to get to that, uh, before we can actually start performing those surgeries. In that province, individual health authorities will determine if they can safely open up and whether they have the PPE to do it. I, I have my, <laughs> my pills here. It can't come soon enough for this oh Ottawa goodness. mother with two ovarian cysts that need to be removed. She is still waiting to get on the wait list. And right now, <laughs> the pain is all the time. Trying times for those waiting for surgeries to bring them comfort and possibly so much more. Renee Filippone, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, time now to ask our experts. And joining us once again is Dr. Michael Curry, emergency room physician for Delta Hospital and professor at UBC's Department of Emergency Medicine. So uh, plenty of time right now to get your questions in. The email address is right there, as is the phone number. And if you're online, you can post a question in the comments section. Dr. Curry, good to uh, see you again tonight. Good evening, Mike. So let me ask you, first of all, uh, the big announcement today about trying to catch up on all those uh, non-emergency or elective uh, surgeries. Is, is it surprising to you that we're talking about two years to, to try to clear that backlog? Unfortunately, no. In Canada, we're used to fairly long wait lists for elective surgeries. And one thing to keep in mind, when we hear elective surgery, people think of you know cosmetic procedures and very minor type procedures. But for a lot of people on the wait list for so-called elective surgery, the surgery is anything but elective. People with very painful arthritis, needing joint replacement or other orthopedic procedures or cataract surgery, um, those procedures are fairly serious procedures and they already have long wait times which have been further moved back, unfortunately, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to ask you, uh, we've of course heard Dr. Bonnie Henry over the last couple of days talking about expanding our social circles without letting that deadly virus in. But it, it is interesting to hear the language she's using, and I'm curious about uh, your take on it. She even referenced uh, what they're doing in uh, New Zealand. Re they're referring to it as uh, double your bubble, uh, you know, mm -hmm. increasing uh, the social gatherings to between two and, two and six people. Um, are people going to get that message that we still have to, to keep these gatherings small, or do you think this is giving them a bit of license, a bit of leash to perhaps uh, uh, include more people than that. Well, I think that's a bit of a concern. Already, uh, people's uh, people's attention to the uh, social distancing requirements 
in my exposure are not quite as strict as they may have been, say, a month ago. So we know that there's a natural fatigue with these measures over time. The other thing is, is we're looking for a gradual return. So this isn't a carte blanche. Things are unfortunately not going back to the February 2020 normal in the next couple of weeks, but we will be able to open the door a little bit, uh, have some social gatherings, and uh, be a little bit less aware than we have been before. I just hope people are able to keep in mind that this virus isn't gone. We don't have a treatment, we don't have a cure, and without proper social distancing, the virus could return. Okay, let's get to a question from uh, Jory, this one on Facebook. Now I know that uh, uh, Dr. Henry has said that uh, when it comes to testing, anybody who uh, shows symptoms can get tested. Uh, but Jory is asking, when will our province increase testing? Is there a plan to test more residents, perhaps those who may not even uh, display symptoms, as things start to reopen? Well, I think testing um, of patients without symptoms becomes very difficult. You know, there's 4.7 million or so British Columbians, you know, in that category. So there's been a real change. You know, I spent the last six weeks from mid-March through to the uh, end of April, you know, telling people we just don't have the capacity to test unless you were so sick, you were coming into hospital, you were a healthcare worker or some other circumstances. Uh, that's changed. In the last couple of weeks, we've been testing much more broadly. We're able to test people with fairly mild and often fairly vague symptoms. And in my experience, uh, I find that the test results are actually coming back quite quickly, usually within less than 24 hours. So we're doing a lot better, but these are for patients with symptoms. Asymptomatic testing isn't really useful because it doesn't mean you're not going to get it two days from now, nor does it tell you that you might have had it last week. That's a role for antibody testing, and we don't have that available as of yet. Okay, Dr. Curry, um, Mary has called in asking, are people who have recovered from COVID infections, uh, sorry, are people who have recovered from COVID infectious afterwards? We've had more than uh, 1,500 people now fully recovered. Um, being infectious afterwards, uh, almost for sure, no. This is a new virus and we're still learning a lot about it. So I'm hesitant to say anything definite because uh, we've learned so much about this virus in the last couple of months. But we're pretty sure that once you have recovered, if you don't have symptoms, you're no longer producing the virus and you should no longer be infectious. Okay, and let, let's just uh, wrap this up by asking if, if, if there's still, is there one thing uh, people are doing uh, that they should keep doing no matter what? So I think probably if I had to choose one single thing, it's for people to wash their hands. We know that uh, dirty hands spread the disease to others and they spread it to yourselves. So frequent hand washing is, I suppose, if I had only one thing to recommend, <laughs> that's what I'd recommend. All right, we'll go with that. Wash your hands. Dr. Curry, thanks so much for joining us again tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Well, could the puck drop in the midst of a pandemic? Just ahead, the Canadian cities, including Vancouver, applying to host NHL games in empty arenas. And at 6.43, a live look at Tofino tonight. That's the Pacific Sands Beach Cam. Beautiful evening there. And a stunning day on the south coast, and there's more of it to come. Brett's forecast is next.
Well, there's no doubt many people are missing professional sports right now. The NHL has a proposal to try to alleviate that, at least a little bit. The idea involves a few hub cities where several teams would be based and play in empty arenas. And as Briar Stewart tells us, there are a few Canadian cities applying for the job. This is what hockey looks like now that this Burnaby rink has reopened. No more than five people on the ice at once and everyone must stay three meters apart. We can do skill development as long as we have to. And is the one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two game scenario going to take place? Not for a while. Backhander scores! But the NHL is hoping to be able to bring back the game. The idea is to play out the remaining season in the playoffs over the summer in a limited number of hub cities. Players would stay in hotels and play in empty arenas. I have written to uh, the head of the NHL as well. BC's as Premier NHL John Horgan Services. thinks Vancouver would be ideal. The Edmonton Oilers have also put forward a proposal, and there's talk about Toronto being interested as well. In a normal economy, those benefits would not be significant. But in this case, every dollar is significant. But there are questions around how it will work. Will players have to quarantine and for how long? They have legitimate concerns just like you or I do at work. And Sports host Randeep Janda says some NHLers aren't too keen on being separated from their families, but the league wants the revenue and many fans are sports deprived. I think people are wanting to watch anything and everything. Okay, let's go to the Eastern Conference highlights from game one last night. And, and this is proof of that. Online, thousands have watched Dustin Nielsen call highlights of a video game. He says as much as he wants to talk about real hockey, he says there's a debate around the benefits of reviving the season given the ongoing pandemic. If people can't go out to bars to watch games or can't go to the game, you know, I don't know outside of the rights holders making a ton of money off of advertising, I don't really know how it benefits everybody else. Well, he isn't sure how many will tune in to hockey in August. For the hardcore fans, it would be a chance to get their fix, even if it means they can't be in these seats to cheer on their team. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And meteorologist Brett Soderholm is back with us. That uh, was a stunning day, to, a stunning evening right now, too. It's beautiful. Absolutely nothing to be complaining about out here. There's a nice little breeze going on as well. And the conditions at this point in time are going to be staying fairly similar to what we saw today. Just an abundance of sunshine. But of course, the one thing that I've been hitting on all week and telling many times is just how warm it's going to be getting. But you know what? This is a really interesting phenomenon to BC and essentially Western Canada because other parts of the country not going to be anything like what we're going to be experiencing. Take a look at some of the current temperatures across Canada right now. You can kind of see a clear divide divide places like Kelowna, Vancouver, Edmonton, all hovering around that 15 degree mark. As soon as you get toward Manitoba and Ontario, colder air is making its way down from the north and that is going to be making very frosty conditions for places like Toronto and Montreal and temperatures this weekend there are going to be cold enough for even the possibility of some snow. So think about that as we're going ahead over the next couple of days and approaching the 30 degree mark for some. Now for today's high temperatures we were seeing pretty well what we should be Vancouver International Airport getting up to about 15 degrees as you go farther inland this is going to be the case all the way throughout the weekend temperatures into the Fraser Valley about five degrees warmer and as I keep saying this is going to be the trend not only just for Vancouver uh, proper but other places as well and we can see on Vancouver Island that was the case as well with temperatures above seasonal we look ahead a little bit and we're going to see nothing but clear skies throughout the overnight tonight and lots of sunshine expected throughout the day tomorrow now tomorrow should be the first day since about September 11th of last year where Vancouver gets above the 20 degree mark and that's not anything particularly significant but just to say it's been quite a while. As a result our UV index is also going to be fairly high so keep that in mind. I was mentioning how sunscreen at this point in time is fairly crucial. Now when we look ahead for the weekend the reason I have such high confidence with this forecast is because this area of high pressure is not going anywhere. It's going to be installing itself over the southern half of BC bringing up warm air from the states and just as another fun little curiosity here, both Whitehorse and Prince Rupert are going to be in the 20 degree mark by the time we get to this weekend. So lots of warmth out west, not so much out east. And our five day forecast here, lots of sunshine as I said come Friday. Saturday and Sunday what you're going to see is a bit of a return to high cloud, those thin wispy cirrus clouds. But beyond that we are going to get some showers once again by about next week. But 24 on Sunday, love it. Thanks Brett.
Spins a web, any size, but does he also pick up your garbage? Meet some local inspiring sanitation workers next. Our lives are rapidly changing. When the news affects you most, we're still here. Stay calm, stay informed. We're all in this together. I'm clapping for all of us. There's so many essential workers. I want them to be seen. Turn on your radio and join us as we bring you a little companionship, community, and connection. Weekday mornings, beginning at 5 a.m. There are superheroes all around us these days. Some wear uniforms, others are a little harder to recognize. Our Deborah Goebel shows us a couple of garbage collectors who take their grime-fighting status very seriously. You never really know where or when a superhero is going to show up. We come around and do our job no matter what happens. We're always there for the people. So these days it makes sense that Spider-Man and Captain America might be using their superpowers 
to protect the public disguised as garbage collectors. Like when we were a kid, you know, we thinking about superheroes. You just have to have that hope. Are they going to come? Are they going to be there for us? And it's not just kids. I had a lady, I was just walking back to a call and all of a sudden I hear the little doo up ditty about the Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, she was singing it. There's a recognition out there that frontline workers, and that includes everyone from doctors to those taking away our garbage, are superheroes. I wouldn't say it's difficult being an essential worker. We are proud to do what we're doing. Oh, hi, everybody. Bringing a little levity to the streets is what friendly neighborhood superheroes are for, after all that, and fighting the bad guys, of course. They're waving and they're cheering and they're dressing up for us. It's, it's so heartwarming and it's, uh, it puts a real, uh, real big smile on my heart. These are, after all, difficult times. With the villain disguised as a deadly virus, heroes these days sometimes have to use a little bit more imagination to slay the enemy. I show up in my Spider-Man suit, ready to wear this all day long, and just to make people smile. <laughs> the captain needed to come join in, and I think we've made a good deal the whole time. There was definitely no having to be talked into it, or the captain knew when he needed to be here, it was time. Yeah, Spidey sure liked that one. <laughs> because humor and delight have always been very important superpowers. And who knew the world would need saving again? All superheroes, we got friends across the board everywhere, so you never know who's going to show up on the truck afterwards. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well done, Brian and Brad, Captain America and Spider-Man. Just a reminder, you can always find this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock after the National. Thanks for watching tonight. Stay safe and have a great evening.